In a state where intellectuals are generally scorned as elitists, retired Auburn history professor Wayne Flynn is one expert who is widely known around Alabama, someone who people seem to listen to, at least those who pay attention. Since moving back to my home state and city a few years ago and struggling as a writer to figure out what's wrong with this place, a key question comes up over and over again. No one seems to have a simple, satisfying answer. Why do working class people in the South so frequently vote against their own economic self-interest? As a historian and author, Dr. Flint tackled this question in great detail a little more than 20 years ago in a book called Poor But Proud, Alabama's Poor Whites. Due to the recent sweep in state elections by the Republican Party, and in the wake of recent labor events from Wisconsin to Birmingham, I recently visited Dr. Flint at his church in Auburn and conducted an interview captured on video. We talked for nearly an hour, and answering the question a little more than 20 years after his book came out, Flint said some things you will never see reported by any newspaper or television news station in Alabama because economic imperatives prevent total candor with readers and viewers. And the most obvious uh, question is, why do working class whites so frequently vote against their own economic interests, vote for people who do not represent them, who are very, very uh, susceptible to special lobbyists uh, like uh, uh, the Alabama Chamber of Commerce or some other uh, economic configuration that actually doesn't stand for their interest, and yet they vote that way. And it's partly because preachers tell them that uh, the Democratic Party is a godless party, and partly because uh, the Democratic Party is uh, made up of a large number of African Americans, and, and working class whites just won't vote that way. If you go back and take a look at the history of Alabama politics before the 1960s, as Dr. Flint did in his book, you won't find much of a discussion in families of social wedge issues like birth control, abortion, obscenity in the media, prayer in schools, or gay rights. Now what you get after the 1960s is the promotion of that into an alternative agenda. That is one of the major things that divided the labor movement uh, in the 1960s, and so now you just don't have ethnicity and race. You have all these cultural war issues that make it even more difficult to bring workers together just on behalf of the um, quality of life that they're going to have and their kids are going to have, and they're not going to be much affected by these other issues. Unfortunately, after the culture wars of the 1960s, uh, there is a division, not along class lines, which is what had been the case before. After the Second World War, after 1945, the old politics of race tended to reappear, and especially after 1954 and the Brown decision. So for a very brief period of the 1930s and midway through the 40s, you have a politics of class. Then you have the integration movement, the civil rights movement, and you revert to the old politics. And it's all about race, 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 race. I think what I see is, is what I would call really hard support for Republicans and conservative politics from an awful, awful lot of traditional uh, power elites and lobbyist groups in Alabama and individual voters. Uh, they don't want to pay taxes, they don't care about public schools because their kids aren't in public schools, they're in private schools and they're not having to worry about it because right. they don't have a dog in they their don't want to pay twice, they're already paying and, and, they're, and they also particularly don't want to pay for black kids in public schools. Even if, even if they are willing to pay for their own kids in, in public schools, they're not going to sub subsidize schools like, for instance, in Birmingham, increasingly in, in, uh, in Huntsville, and Montgomery and Mobile and the inner city and they're certainly not going to support schools in the Black Belt where virtually all the kids are black. Well this is just absolutely suicidal because white people are not having children. People of color are having children. Already 54 percent of the kids in Alabama public schools are on free and reduced meals. Sometime around 19, uh, 2017 the majority of, school, of kids in public schools in Alabama are going to be children of color. If you don't educate them, you got no future in this state. You might as well move to Connecticut or Washington State or someplace else because there's no future for Alabama in a global economy. If you're not going to support schools, and then there is what I call soft support for Republican policies. And these are people who generally don't like taxes, they don't like corporate taxes in, in particular, but on the other hand... They don't like government. And they don't like government. What they want is policy change. 
They want more accountability in education. They want more and better schools. They want more accountable teachers, and they're willing to pay for it if they need to. And we've just seen what happened in Wisconsin about what I think the real agenda is. The real agenda is to make the United States like Alabama was in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, if, if, if there is some, in fact, uh, uh, people in Wisconsin were even talking about the Southern policy toward economic development, which is basically keep unions out, stop regulation of business, uh, provide state-funded incentives uh, so that your tax money is really going to try to recruit an industry that is then going to be exempt from paying taxes for 30 years, which means they will not be supporting the kind of infrastructure you need to build a modern state. Uh, and, and, of course, above everything else, it's anti-union. And to me, uh, if that is the proper strategy for Wisconsin to follow, you would have thought that in 100 years, Alabama and all the other states would be way, way beyond where Wisconsin is right now. So if uh, that's the appropriate strategy, why aren't we the most prosperous, best educated places in America? Because Lord knows we pursued that strategy longer and harder than any other region in the United States. Now it becomes unions. It's really the only legal entity recognized by the Supreme Court that can actually take on corporate power. That's correct. And basically what United America's United did was to load the political culture of the United States against working class people because corporations have huge amounts of money and their their leadership just decide how it's going to be spent. Right. Unions have small and declining amounts of money to invest in politics and they're going to be simply overwhelmed. That is, unless the union leaders and rank and file workers wake up and get involved in the political process, make its case to the American people online and in protest if necessary, and start voting in their own economic best interest. I think you're going to see a lot of elections turn around in uh, 2012 in places like Wisconsin and Ohio, where finally apathetic workers discover that all of those uh, all those battles that were so painfully won in the last years by your mother and father and your grandmother and grandfather are going to be taken away if you just apathetically sit there on your rear end and don't get out and register and don't get out and vote and don't get out and organize, it's going to be gone. And, uh, you know, I think the same thing to some degree is happening to blacks. They're understanding that, you know, our, our forefathers won these battles, but assuming that because they were won once, we don't ever have to do anything more. Well, that's a fatal mistake. Because it has been a long time since you read anything in any media, print media, uh, that basically treats labor fairly or favorably. Right. Uh, and it's not that I think labor is always right. I don't. I think labor is sometimes totally wrong. But I just like to read somebody who tells me what I consider to be a fair and balanced view of a labor position on sure. something, and you simply don't get that in the national right. media. Yeah, and or the local. Or the local media. Advertisers in the Birmingham News and the Mobile Paper and the Huntsville Paper aren't interested in covering working class union issues. No. And so as a consequence... Are they interested in covering Iraq or Afghanistan no, no, or Pakistan? No, or no, they, you know, they do not cover international news. We hadn't brought that word into That's this. right. It's parochial. very parochial, very parochial. What Labor's going to have to do is find a way to communicate with their members who are interested in the economic issues and the future of their job and their kids' jobs and they're going to have to begin to find ways of, of, of using that media in order to educate themselves or educate their friends, educate their members, tell their members, hey, have you watched this? Because you really need to watch this because this is where you're going to learn an awful lot of stuff about what, mean, what it means to be a plumber or an electrician and about regulations and about jobs and about the future. And if you don't watch this, you're, you're, you're not going to be in a... In, you're not going to have a very good life for very long. Considering the national attack on working Americans by corporate elites, it would appear that the only hope for the working class is to wake up and start voting on the basis of practical economics, not social issues. Then, knowing the history of freedom of the press in the United States and how that influences public opinion, working people need to continue the trend of turning to the web for news, information, and entertainment and for labor to help build the alternative independent web press and promote it with social networking. That is the lesson of recent events from Wisconsin to Egypt. I'm Glenn Wilson. 
for the Locust Fort News Journal at locustfort.net.